All righty, guys. Welcome back to another episode of the Upper Room Podcast. Uh, this is Drake Browning, and obviously we're here with Joe Merritt. Um, so, guys, um, obviously tonight we don't have um, Nathan or Jason with us. Um, Jason got caught babysitting, so we're going to be in prayer for him in, in this time because I know he's about to pull his hair out. And also, we want to stay in prayer for Nathan Guess as well because – for the past, man, what, 16 days maybe, he has been putting his life on the line, trying to restore power after this hurricane, trying to get everything back and running. And speaking of getting things back and running, we plan to be back every Thursday bringing you God's holy word. And we, as a congregation of Lighthouse Assembly of God, some of, the, some of the men, we got together one day and was like, you know what, man? People don't understand God's word. Uh, people may can quote a scripture here or there, but they still don't have the correct interpretation. And God laid on my heart one night. He said, Drake, because I was praying and I talked to God just like I talked to my homeboys or my friends, whatever. And God explicitly told me one night, he said, son, how do you know what I want you to do if you don't even know me? And I said, man. So I began asking myself, well, God, how do I get to know you? And he said, I've already revealed myself in my word. There's been trials, tribulations, stories. I handled certain situations the way I did because there was a reflection of my character. So if you want to find out who I am and my will for your life, you need to understand me, what makes me angry, what brings, you know, blessings to God. So um, it is in our, you know, wishes that you'll watch this, you'll take some notes, and you'll have a desire to want to get into your word and to be able to know God a little bit better so you can carry out a relationship with him and you'll be able to go back and forth with God on your personal level. Because at the end of the day, all this Bible study stuff is cute, but if you don't know Jesus Christ yourself, then I'm afraid you could be on judgment day and he could say, I don't know you, depart from me. And that breaks my heart. Because um, I was looking at statistics the other day, only 31.8% of the population claims to be Christians. And unfortunately, out of those 31%, Christ said there's going to be people that casted out demons that would heal people, that could prophesy, that he still doesn't know. So that tells him right there that even though 31% of the world claims to be a Christian, <laughs> 31% of people are not Christians in this world. And that should scare all of us Christians. It should motivate us to do better. It should motivate us to get a relationship with the Holy Spirit so we can do what he wants us to do. Um, but with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and get into tonight's episode. Um, so we are on the fifth chapter of Matthew. I'm not going to take a long time uh, summarizing the previous chapters. If you want to go watch the other chapters, you can find the link in the description, either up top if you're on Facebook or below if you're on YouTube, but you can find the link to the playlist of the other episodes um, so you can go catch up. But just real briefly, so we all understand what's going on tonight before we dive into God's holy word, Jesus started his ministry in chapter four. Uh, we read where uh, he got baptized in chapter three by John the Baptist. After he was baptized, the heavens opened up and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And after that, he went to the will wilderness in chapter four. He went there for 40 days and 40 nights. He fasted. And then because he fasted and he's doing what God wanted him to do. And when you do what God wants you to do, you're going to face temptation from the enemy, from his demons or him himself. It just depends. So the enemy came after Jesus and he tried to give him several different temptations. He tried to tempt his flesh, his desires, everything. He tried to tempt Jesus to fall. And if you want to learn how to beat temptation, how to overcome temptation, I encourage you, go back and watch our chapter four episode because we're going to explain more in detail about how you can be an overcomer, how you can overcome temptation because we need to know how Jesus overcame temptation if we want to overcome temptation. So please go watch that episode if you haven't already. But then after Jesus overcame temptation, he started his ministry. What does that mean for you and I? Well, that simply means you can't start your ministry until you overcome temptation. Nobody wants to listen to somebody that can't overcome the smallest little piece of temptation because God promised that through his Holy Spirit, you can be an overcomer. Titus 2.5, or it may not be 2.5, but somewhere in the book of Titus, it tells us that grace empowers us to say no to ungodliness, any form of ungodliness. So before you start your ministry, you have to be able to overcome temptation and be holy and live for Christ. But I can promise you it's not by your own works. We're 
We're going to get to that in a minute because he's going to be touching on self-righteousness tonight. But um, it's by his power that can be on the inside of you through a relationship with Jesus Christ himself that you can overcome because it's his power. So he started teaching. Large crowds started coming. He started pulling disciples. They were all fishing, right? He started saying, hey, why don't you come follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. So to make a long story short, the end of chapter four, Jesus started preaching the gospel, casting out demons, healing people with diseases such as leprosy. And um, it was a powerful move. Joe, you remember this, but God even laid on my heart that there was somebody that needed a physical healing. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, God just doesn't do that for no reason. So I, I mean, me and Joe prayed a prayer through the power of the Holy Spirit that somebody would receive their healing. And I never do that. That's why I had to do it. Because when God speaks it to me, I ha I'm going to be held accountable if I obeyed him or not. Right. So somebody received the healing. And that is awesome. Um, so God can still heal. But now, because Jesus is casting out demons, he's healing the sick. He is preaching a gospel, um, the good news. So now he's starting to get large crowds. So now we're going to turn our, our attention to chapter 5. And this is most famous because it's a part of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is probably the greatest sermon of all time. It was Jesus' sermon on top of a mountain. So that's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's it's great because it is the best evangelical tool that Christ has ever gave us. Because when Christ was preaching, he was preaching to a group of people that has something called the Mosaic Law. And the Mosaic Law, to make things very simple, was a, a set of rules. If you want to go to heaven, you must do this. You must do that. You must do this. There was like 613, 614. Uh, there, there was a lot. There was over 600 laws that people had to keep. And the Bible says, if you broke one law, you broke all the laws. So to make a long story short, people were listening to Jesus and they had this mindset. If I do this, then I'm, you know, I'm damned. If I do this, I'm damned. If I do that, I'm damned. So the bottom line is Jesus was preaching to a crowd of thinking, I have to be righteous on the outward. I have to do things outwardly to live to these laws to be self-righteous. So let's go to chapter five, verse one. Let's dig in. The Sermon on the Mount. One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, this is crowds coming to hear Jesus. Jesus went up on the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. So verse three is the start of something called the Beatitudes. And these Beatitudes are something that every Christian should almost produce. It's almost like fruit, right? Like the fruits of the spirit. These Beatitudes are characteristics and attitudes of Christians. So if you call yourself a Christian while we're reading this, I want you to ask yourself these questions. Do I possess these traits that Jesus is describing? Verse number three, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. I do want to add a little comment right here, because God was speaking to me at this very moment when I was preparing for this podcast. Um, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. Um, the New King James Version says, God blesses those who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's the New King James Version. And what God was speaking to me is he says, Drake, there's, there's a lot of preachers. There's a lot of gospel teachers that will teach. If you come to know Christ, you will get peace. If you come to Christ, you will be happy. If you come to Christ, the whole world is going to get better. When you give your life to Jesus, no bad things are going to happen to you because you're now, you know, a part of God's kingdom. So everything's good. You're going to go get, you know, the cars, the house you want, um, the job promotion. But here Christ says, God blesses those who thirst for righteousness. And we all have a problem of sin and we all think we're good people. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I promise we're about to confront those who think they're morally good. But we should come to God because we're sinners. I'm a sinner. Joseph's a sinner. Okay. We should come to him because he can make us righteous. Only through Jesus can we be made perfect in the eyes of God. So we shouldn't come to him for material things, for promotions, for a higher status. We should come to him because we understand that we have a problem of sin and we want to be righteous through Christ. 
verse 7. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. And I highlighted this verse because I had an experience the other day. And um, I promise um, when you guys start digging into God, you want a better relationship with him. The Holy Spirit is the reminder. Um, he's a lot more than just that. and uh, But he will remind you of scripture. And again, I was preparing for this, but there was a situation the other day. I was in my car and I was talking with somebody. And I'm not going to give names or references, but this kid was telling me, he's like, Coach Drake, this happened. And I'm kind of mad at this person because they said this about me behind my back. And I could have easily went into that and I could have said, oh my goodness, I can't believe that he would say that about you behind your back. I could have poured into that and I could have made that situation worse between that person and the other person. But in that very moment, God quickened me and I had to repent because when I say repent, that means to change the way you think. If it wasn't for this verse, I would have never repented, which means I would have never have changed the way that I think. And because I changed the way that I think about certain scenarios, because I, I compare my life to scripture, I was able to therefore use this verse where God said, blessed are those who work for peace. And when God reminded me of that verse, I said, you know what? I need to pour peace into this situation. So I said, man, have you ever thought about why the other person may have said that? Have you done something in the past that would warrant that? Have you done something that that person would be like, whoa, dude, like maybe I need to watch out for you a little bit, you know? So I began to pour peace and the Holy Spirit in that very moment poured into that kid and said, you know what? You're right. I was wrong. I shouldn't feel that way. So in that very moment, and this is not for me to boast because I'm just trying to give you personal experiences so you can realize, hey, I can have a personal walk with God and I want you to know how achievable it truly is. But in that very moment, that that guy began to say, you know what? You're right. I was wrong. So now the Holy Spirit through me was able to operate and pour into him. And even though he has probably never read this verse, he got to see a glimpse of that. And maybe now he'll come to know Christ because I do witness to him. So maybe he'll know to come Christ and one day find out this awesome truth. But again, we're still in the Beatitudes. So ask yourself, am I displaying these traits of a biblical Christian? Verse 10, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. So now we're going to go to verse 13. So before we go to verse 13, Verse 12, 3 through 12, caps the Beatitudes. Again, these are biblical traits that God gave us through his word so we can see, do we display these traits? Do we do a good job of showing these things? And I want to just quickly give you a summary. So like maybe you're kind of, you know, quiet, not understanding what some of this meant. Okay. So God in these Beatitudes in verse 6, that we should come to Christ for righteousness, not happiness, right? But God is saying people that follow him, his followers, or if you want to be blessed by God, not just in this life, but the next life, you must be humble. You must be compassionate. You must be gentle. You must seek righteousness. You must be merciful. <clears throat> you must be pure in your heart. You must be a peacemaker and you have to endure persecution. You must stand firm in the faith of God. So now that we've read about the Beatitudes, Christ is going to touch on the Beatitudes. And remember, he's talking to a whole group of people, right? So now he just expressed all these traits that we should all possess. Can you imagine if we all possessed humbleness, righteousness, <clears throat> the ability to be peacemakers? Could you imagine if every Christian could produce those traits? What do you think that person would say? Oh, my goodness. That guy's a Christian. Joe Merritt, that guy, he has all these traits. He is a follower of Christ. If you can do these things, that will be great to the kingdom of heaven. That's why you'll be blessed because not only are you doing what God wants you to do, but others are watching you. They're looking for these traits because when they look in the world, they don't see these traits. So that's why this was great that Christ started off. 
But now that he possessed all these traits or explained all these traits, he's going to talk about teaching about salt and light. And by the way, guys, um, if you're following, following along with us in the Bible, we are reading and preaching out of the NLT version. So if you want to kind of read along with us, I should have said this at the beginning, but if you want to follow along, we're in the New Living Translation, if you just want to follow along. <clears throat> I was going to get to that. I was going to say a while ago, and I changed your mind, and I said, well, I'll just say it at the end to let everybody know that yeah, we're in the NLT, yeah. <laughs> NLT, the New Living Translation. Yeah. So, That's Joe, let, let me ask you this, man. Do you think us as Christians, do you think we could do better displaying these Beatitudes? Or like, do you think we could all, and I'm talking about as a body of Christ, do you think we all could do better with displaying these traits? Yes. Uh, there's a lot of times that you know, the people do look, I say people do watch us as Christians. They want to, they want to, they look at us, you know, and see what we do. I've heard many times of people going back, hey, I heard, you know, I thought Joe was going to church and he, I seen him the other day. I, he, he got mad when he was driving, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, people watch us as, yeah. as a Christian, people do watch us and see what we, how we live. So we, as a Christian, you are being watched by somebody who's not, there's somebody looking up to you all the time. If it's a kid, it could be, it could be some an older person. That's going to walk by one day and see you doing with something. You know, where you stopped to help somebody on the side road with a flat tire. You helped give out water in a line for Amen. eight hours one day. Amen. And just to see your, see if, are you a Christian? Are you working? Are you doing something for the kingdom of God? So, yeah, people watch us, man. Yeah. And John, I do find it very interesting that you said that because we're about to go to verse 13 and these Beatitudes, Joe just said. People watch you, right? So let's see what Christ said, because Christ is going to say pretty much the same thing. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Now, who's the salt of the earth? The salt of the earth are the people that adhere to these beatitudes, the people that are peacemakers, that are gentle, that are meek, which means able to be strong in times where they need to be strong and not weak. Um, those people that follow the beatitudes, they are the salt of the earth. So I want you to understand that when, as we're reading, everything's connected. So Christ is always scaffolding and building off what, what he says for, for a central message. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. And this goes really well with what Job was just saying, because what if one day you're shown the Beatitudes and you're the salt of the earth? People are looking at you. And they're saying, that guy is a man of God. He was at Lighthouse the other day, and the hurricane came through, and they were giving out water. They are so awesome because they are there in a time of need. But then, like Joe said, you go and you flick somebody off in traffic because they cut you off. You have just lost your salt. And Jesus said, what good is salt if it loses its saltiness? It can only be trampled under the feet. So now next time you go to witness or you go to you know talk to somebody about Jesus, there is some truth that people are going to look at you and say, oh, well, that guy, Joe, which Joe don't do this. I'm just using references. But that guy, Joe, flicked me off the day in traffic because I was just driving to pull out in front of him on accident. And he's supposed to be some Christian. That's why Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Keep these, but don't lose your salt. There's going to be times you slip and fall as a Christian. I understand that. But it is important that you strive, man, and you stay strong with God and you renew your mind daily. So when these times come, you have enough you know, I like to say it like this, man. As a football team, because I'm a football coach, as a football team, we have to work out every day. If we go a day without working out or a day without practicing football, we are not going to win on Friday nights. So how do you expect to win the moment of temptation or keep your beatitudes or your attitudes that way, the, the character of Christ? How are we supposed to keep these things if we're not working out in our, in our, in our daily lives by reading scripture, by knowing God's word? So that's why it's very important. And that's how, because I know people's going to be saying, but Drake, I can't do that all the time. That's a lie from the enemy. Get in your word every day. And I promise you'll have enough strength because just like we go and pump weights, we do that. So we'll have enough strength for the rest of the season to go out and win games. If you want to gain more strength, get in this word more. All right. Verse 14, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Again, I highlighted this verse because how many times do you guys hear, well, you're a Christian, but you should really keep your religion to yourself. 
I know you're, I know you love Jesus, but we shouldn't really talk about Jesus right now because they may not believe in Jesus. They may have other beliefs, but Christ here in verse 14 says, you're the light of the world. We should, as a Christian, especially with these beatitudes, we should be like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. We should be, we should shine that much of a light to a dark world that there is no hiding that we're a Christian. As a matter of fact, there is no such thing as an undercover Christian or a secret Christian. You're either a Christian or you're not. You're either displaying these fruits or you're not. That's just the bottom line. I understand there's a sanctification process, but you understand what I'm referring to here. Verse 15, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. So again, don't just be a Christian in front of Christians. Be a Christian in front of the world. All right, verse 16. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see. So everybody should see these characteristics Jesus described so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. And I'm so glad that obviously Jesus included this because when we perform or when I say perform, whenever we display the Beatitudes, because that's our characteristics as a born again Christian, it's not so you can get glory. Ah, oh, Joe's a man of God. Oh, Joe is so holy. No, this is for people to say God has done a work in Joe. And God has done a work in you, okay? So now we're about to go to verse 17. So in this moment, God goes and talks. He goes from talking about you. So Jesus is talking about you, your attitudes, your beatitudes. God will bless you if you do this. You are the light of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. He goes from talking about you. And now he's about to talk about him and his purpose according to the law. And I want us to understand something real quick before I do dive a little bit deeper into uh, God's word here. Okay. Jesus was preaching, but in that time, the way to get to heaven to these people was they thought I have to do these mosaic laws. I have to keep these laws. I have to follow all 600 plus of these laws. That's the only way I can get to heaven is I have to do these things. So he is about to state his position on the law of Moses. And this is going to be very interesting because there's probably Pharisees and scribes in here, which means people that study God's word, like somebody like me or Joe tonight, able to teach God's word. We would have been considered a scribe or a Pharisee because we know the Bible good enough to teach it. So um, he's about to confront those type of people. Verse 17, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. I come, or it says, no, I come to abolish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. And I do want to comment on this because this verse or these verses 17 and 18, they can seem very confusing because it says, or Jesus Christ himself said, I've not come to abolish the law. But then we're going to read later in the New Testament from Paul and the other apostles that we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace and we're under the new covenant. So we have to reconcile and ask, why did he say this and how do we interpret this? And there's two reasons why the number one, we don't abolish the law. Number one, Paul wrote in the book of Romans that the law is like our spiritual mirror, right? When I witness the people, it's, it's, it's hard to witness when I bring forth God's law. Let me give you an example. Matter of fact, I'm going to do it on you at home tonight. I'm, I'm addressing you tonight. I'm fitting to share the gospel with you in a nutshell. Everybody thinks they're a good person. So if I was to ask you right now, hey, such and such, are you a good person? Without hesitation, you're going to say, yes, I'm a great person. I'm so good. I'm morally good. I'm not a bad person. There's no way you're a bad person, right? Let's let's um let's test your standard versus God's standard. We're going to get to this later in the Gospels, but the rich young ruler came to Jesus and was just talking about how good Jesus was. And Jesus responded very interestingly. He said, "Why do you say I'm good?" Because the man was looking at Jesus who was a man. Jesus was fully man, but fully God. Just like a father is a son, He's fully a son, but he's fully a father as well. But Jesus was fully God, fully man. So he asked this guy, he said, why do you say I'm good? There is none good but God. So if you're a good person, if you say, Drake, I'm a good person, then that means Jesus Christ is a liar. 
then that means Christ has lied because he said there is none good but God. And if you think God is good, that is not good news because that means a good God is going to judge a bad creation, you and I, who are bad people. And you may say, well, how am I a bad person? I donate to charity. I do this. I do that. There's no way I'm a bad person. If you just look at the Ten Commandments, that's the moral law, okay? Lust, okay, which we're about to obviously touch on this literally just a couple verses down. But if you've ever looked at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in God's eyes. And I've just said earlier, if you broke, if you break one law, you've broken all the laws. So in God's eyes, you are an adulterer. You're damned for hell, right? So just that one thing has made you a bad person in the eyes of God. And it's only through Jesus and what he did on the cross that you can find everlasting life. So that's why we can't abolish the law because if, if there was no such thing as the law of Moses, I wouldn't be able to convince you that you're a bad person because you would be so stuck in the idea, I'm a good person. I'm a really good person. It is the law of God that brings forth the knowledge of sin. I used to think I was a good person. I thought I was going to heaven because I'm, I'm a good guy. But when I started reading the Bible and I was like, man, I've, I've lusted, so I've committed adultery. I've lied. I've stolen. I'm in trouble because that's how God's going to judge me on judgment day. But because of Jesus, I can go past that. So we would never have a need for a savior if there was no law. If we had no law to tell us how bad we were, we wouldn't even need Jesus. So that's why the law, its purpose has already been achieved because Christ has came to down the cross. Number two, this poem is really interesting to me. Um, I, I got this from a, another pastor, and this point is really profound to me personally. He said, you can think of the law as a seed. And he said, when you plant a seed, especially if it's you know um, um, a fruit seed, one day when you plant it, it's going to produce a tree that will produce fruit. And he went on to illustrate the idea that uh, the law is like the seed. And because it's a seed, it's going to one day become a tree. But that tree would never be possible without the seed. Christ, the new covenant, the idea of grace, mercy, and the love of God could never be revealed to us if there was no law. So the law had a purpose for its time. It, for, for the time, it had to reveal to us how sinful you and I are. And because of Christ, now that seed, the law, has changed into the new covenant. So now we are under a new covenant and the law was written in our hearts. And Christ said the, the best law you can have is to love God and to love your neighbor. If you do those things, that is the essence of the law. So that's why Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law. He's not trying to tear the law down. I forgot what the Greek word was when I was doing my study, but the Greek word for that word abolish meant to just rip it apart. Christ has not come to rip apart the law, but he has come to fulfill the law. And when he said he's fulfilled the law, he's lived the life that you and I couldn't. He kept the Sabbath holy. He never lied. He has never stolen. He has never looked upon a woman with lust. So for God, for Jesus Christ himself, he has fulfilled the law. And because he was a fulfillment of the law, he was perfect. He could then go down the cross where now we can live and put our faith in him in order to receive true righteousness and be saved and to be able to go to heaven. <clears throat> so we're going to continue and go to verse 19. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I highlighted this verse because I want you to put your mind in the audience. Put your mind, you're there, you're listening to Jesus teach. But Jesus just said, you know, those who ignore the commandments, and he's trying to talk about people because in their mind, right, they're saying, well, I'm, I'm going to keep these laws. I'm going to keep them because that's what they base their righteousness. He says, but I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers, so the scribes and Pharisees, the people that study, they're scholars, they know the word. <laughs> he says, your righteousness, your righteousness has to be better than the teachers of the religious law and Pharisees or you're never going to enter. He just straight up called them out because he said they seem righteous. If you're in the crowd and you heard him say that, 
whenever you think of the Pharisees, you don't think of them as bad people. You don't think of them as people that are not holy. You hold the Pharisees in a high regard because those people are the ones that know God's law. They know what to do and they know how to be righteous, right? Because they're teachers. They're teaching you how to live. Could you imagine if Jesus called out your pastor? What would be your thoughts if Jesus said, well, and again, I'm going to just call out Pastor Donald. I'm not really calling him out. But say Jesus was teaching and he said, unless your righteousness is better than Pastor Donald, you're not going to heaven. You would be shocked because you'd be like, man, what's wrong with Brother Donald? So this is really captivating them. And let's continue to read and go further. Because Christ is going to explain what he means. He's about to teach about anger. Verse 21. You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. So again, verse 21, all it's saying is there's a law that says you must not commit murder. So the the Pharisees of that time would have said, you can't murder. You can't murder. That is an outward thing. Murder is outward. So they're saying you cannot murder. And then Jesus says in verse 22, but I say, if if you are angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. So Jesus just said, If you're angry with somebody, you're a murderer. So that's why he's saying righteousness isn't just our stuff. Righteousness is really inward. Because if you're angry with somebody, you might as well go kill them. Because in God's eyes, he's taking you further than just the law. So in God's eyes, if you're angry with somebody in the law, you are a murderer. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. And if you don't believe in a literal hell, reread that verse. Verse 23. If you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and reconcile to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So before we go into verse 25, that's why Jesus said, unless your righteousness is better than the Pharisees, you're not going to heaven because the Pharisees will stop right there. Don't commit murder. And then they stop. They teach, don't murder. Don't commit murder. Don't commit murder. Don't commit murder. And he's saying that that's great and all, but your righteousness has to be more. Don't even be angry with somebody. That's how deep this is with God. God strives for perfection, perfection to be perfect. And it is more than just an outward murder. It is being even being angry with somebody. So that, that's why he said, if you're at the altar trying to do a sacrifice, you better go make things right with that person before you finish the sacrifice because it is meaningless if you, if you still have hate for them in your heart. All right, verse 25. When you are on the way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you will be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. That means if you don't let go, then you're going to get what you owe and you're going to have to pay all of the consequences that come along with you hating that person and not forgiving them. Verse 27, you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. Again, I'm going back to verse 20. Verse 20, Jesus says, unless your righteousness is better than the Pharisees. And again, I keep saying this because I want you guys to truly understand this. I don't want you to skip that verse. Unless your righteousness is truly better than those of the Pharisees, you're not going to heaven. Here's what he means. The Pharisees say, don't commit adultery. Don't commit adultery. You better not commit adultery. But I say anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So again, that's why your righteousness, that would be better righteousness. You know, if if I didn't even look at a woman with lust, I'm never going to commit adultery. So my righteousness would be better than a Pharisee because... The Pharisees would try and find loopholes in the law. Well, I can go to the beach and look all I want because ultimately I'm not sleeping with her. So I can go all day and look all I want. But Christ said, if you even look at a woman or a man with lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. That's why righteousness, it's more about an inner transformation. An inner transformation has to take place before the outward can express and be shown. And he wants us to understand it's more than just don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. It is an inward thing. All right, where where was I at? 28. 28. But I say to one, whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Verse 29. So if your eye, even your good eye, 
causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your entire body or your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than it is for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Again, there's a lot of people out there these days that don't believe in a literal hell. And I want to ask you, what do you think Jesus means whenever he says, hey, it's better to cut out your hand if it caused you to sin than to have both hands and go to hell or gouge out your eye because it's better to lose one body part and go to heaven than it is to have your entire body parts and go to hell. I don't think Christ would have said that if there wasn't a literal hell. Now, I do want to touch on this, and I don't think Christ was being direct here. He doesn't literally mean if you go to the beach and look at a woman, you must gouge your eye out. You must gouge it out. But what he is saying is, if you have a lust problem, you better not go to the beach. You Just stay away from the beach. I personally no longer go to the beach. As a man of God, why would I put myself in a situation where I'm going to go to the beach when there's half-naked women? I'm just being real tonight. We might lose a lot of followers off this, but I'm just here to preach God's word and truth and in boldness. If you go somewhere and you cannot maintain and sustain God and Christ in you, don't go. Because it is better for you to cut off situations. And when he says cut your hand off, if you can't be around a certain crowd of people, because every time you're around them, they peer pressure you, stop hanging around those people. It is better to get away from those people than to be with those people and end up going to hell. That's exactly right. It is right. Because if your friends, if they have an influence of you, over, if your friends over, influence you enough to golf drinking, smoking, speeding up and down the road, and you know better, and you feel a little tug at your heart, man, you don't need to be doing this, and you do it anyway, that little tug, that was the Holy Spirit right there telling you, hey, don't do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you might get, you might, nothing might not happen. You might race that buddy, that buddy with your truck, and you might win. But afterwards, you know, well, if, during that race, you motor blowed up. Now you got to tell your mom and daddy, hey, listen, I blew my truck up because I was racing. Mm-hmm. Well, if you wreck, well, if drinking at one time, you got in a wreck or cops got pulled up on you. Now you just got caught. You know, God tells us, I know it's kind of off subject, but it's no, um, I mean, it's, it's right on subject. Cut it off. Yeah, don't don't know, put yourself in that situation. You know, if your friends are, if your <clears throat> friends are telling you, Hey man, let's go off and do this. And it don't sit easy with your heart. And it can, God convicts you of, Hey, don't go do that. Don't. You know, I don't have a lot of friends because I don't go off and do other, what others do. You know, I'm 48 years old, be 49 in December. I've never been drunk. I've never done no drugs. You've been drunk I've, in the spirit, baby. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never done any kind of, I've never, well, I can't say I've never tasted alcohol because I have tasted alcohol, mm-hmm. but I've never been drunk. I've never done drugs. I never smoked, you know, and that stuff God has kept me from. Now I have been places I shouldn't have been. When God's punished me, you know, I've had to I've had to pay repent repent for that. But I'm not perfect. But man, if God's convinced you of something other, and He convinced you of, hey, your friend calls you, hey, let's go do this this weekend, and God convinced you, hey, you don't want don't do it, don't. You know, if you might lose that friend guy as a friend, but if he was really your friend to begin with, he wouldn't put you in a situation where you would not be. Mm-hmm. Cut it off, gouge it out, gouge it out. Yeah, you know. And uh, so now we're going to go to verse 31 again. So guys, I want, I want to keep in mind, we're going to take a little middle break here. It's not going to be long, I promise. Okay. So what Christ just did was he said, you know what? Everybody, you think you're so good. There was people in that audience that thought they were righteous because they could look at women all day long, but not sleep with them. So they believed they were right in God's eyes. There was people in there that had not murdered anybody. But they were like, you know what? The next best thing is to hate their guts. And they thought they were right with God because they didn't murder them. What God was saying was, listen, man, this is about perfection. This is about God's standard. The law is deeper than just actions. The law is a lifestyle. And that's why later in the Gospels, we're going to see where they said, man, you know, if you don't put your faith in Christ, you must live by the law. But thank God for Jesus that he came and taught this. He was strictly saying, hey, listen, I'm showing you guys the 
the best Christian in the planet even can't keep these laws. They just can't. The best Christian in the world is going to fall because there's going to be times we all get angry with somebody. There's going to be times you slip and fall, right? Because you're going to be in a bad situation. But he's showing this because it's showing our need for him, our need for Jesus, our need to be cleansed. Why do we need Jesus if we can do it on our own? He's showing you can't do it on your own because this is almost impossible to keep. And he wants his audience to be doomed. He wants his audience to ask the question, how can I live holy if it's this hard? Because we live in a world today where we want to Google things. We want to go to AI and ask ChatGPT or all these other AI resources. We want a quick answer. And Jesus is teaching and he's addressing because if he can address your conscience through these, you know, thought provoking things like, oh, if you even look at a woman, he wants this to resonate. This ain't something he's just giving. He's asking deeply because the deeper he can connect and show you, the more we'll understand our need for him. So now he shifts his teaching to about divorce. We're still talking about the law, right? Because Jesus said in verse 31, you have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless, 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 unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And I want to speak to all my young people. We have so many people that are getting married at a young age. And if you've got the one for you, if you're married to somebody that you know that a shadow of a doubt, that that's the person God has for you, that is awesome. But really take the time before you say out your I do's or your wedding vows that this is somebody that you're going to truly love. And love isn't just emotions. Love isn't just, oh my gosh, that person is so cute. Or, oh my gosh, that person is like, they can sing really good in church, right? Love is about commitment. Can you be committed to this person? Because God is committed to us and he wants us to reflect that through somebody else. So you can't just divorce somebody because you fall out of love with them. That is adultery and you will live in adultery for that. But here's the thing. Divorce is only okay if the male or the female, because there is no such thing as a same same uh, sex marriage. There's no such thing. If the man or the woman is unfaithful, that is the only cause for divorce or sexual immorality, as the New King James Version would put it. And I'm not going to go into that because there's no need to go into it. Sexual immorality is anything that is not clean in the bedroom or goes against the spouse. Unless those two things are happening, you cannot divorce. You cannot do it. It is wrong in the eyes of God. You must work it out and fix it. All right. So again, now we're going to be teaching about vows. Again, guys, I had to repent on this one. Let me read and then I'll explain why. You have also heard that our ancestors were told. And when he says our ancestors were told, it's because the law was there for a very long time. So because your nana, your papa, they may have heard the law, so they would teach their family the law, and then the law would just get passed down, so the law was just a way of lifestyle. So you have also heard that our ancestors were told through the law, you must not break your vows, you must carry out the vows that make, that you make to the Lord. So what this means is, um, people would have to put vows and say, man, I swear to God, or Oh, God, like I promised to make their word that more meaningful so people would know, oh, because you said it in God's name, you have to do it. That's what this is referring to. But Jesus said in verse 34, but I say, do not make any vows. Do not say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And do not say by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say by Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say by my head. Because you can't turn one hair white or one hair black. Just simply say, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. So again, guys, this is what I mean when I say we must repent daily, or we have to repent. When I read this verse, because I'm a football coach, so I'm around a whole younger generation of kids. It was a popular thing whenever they're saying a statement, and somebody didn't believe them, they would say, hey, man, on God, I really did that on God. Because they would say, man, you're not going to lie on God's name. So surely you're telling the truth. And when I was reading this, God began to minister to me. And he was like, Drake, you can't do that. 
because you're you're making vows and Christ simply said, do not do that. The reason for this, because I asked the Holy Spirit, well, why? What's wrong with saying on God? It's just validating the truth. And the Holy Spirit said, Drake, don't you want to be so truthful that you don't have to make a vow? In other words, shouldn't you be so full of truth? Everything that comes out of your mouth is the truth. You don't need any more validation. Should people look at you or Joe or whoever and say, man, this person is all they do is tell the truth. They never lie that you don't have to do any vows. You don't have to say on God or in heaven or on the earth or on my head because, you know, you don't have to do none of that because God wants us to be so full of truth that people can take our word because we are Christians. We are set apart. We are the salt of the earth. He wants people to know, hey, you are a Christian. You are a follower of Christ. So more people will come to him in relationship with him. So don't make any vows. Start today. Repent and say, God, I'm sorry for saying, hey, I did. I mean, I had to do vows today. Change your mind. Next time you're about to make a vow, catch yourself, renew your mind and say, hey, in the fifth chapter of Matthew, God said, don't make any vows. It's just that simple. You can change the way you think about making vows. That's what I had to do. Okay. Now we're going to teaching about revenge. <laughs> I know I'm going to break a record tonight for saying I had to repent. But guys, that is the beautiful thing about God's word. When you read it and you're honest, you will say, God, help me. And, and God helps me. I just gave you multiple illustrations. The Holy Spirit reminds me, Drake, you remember Jesus said, don't do that. And because the Holy Spirit reminded me, it gave me enough strength, enough motivation to not do that. Because that's the Holy Spirit's relationship. If your wife or your husband said, hey, I don't want you to do that, you're not going to do it. So the Holy Spirit says, don't do it. I'm not going to do it. It's just that simple. Teaching about revenge. Verse 38. You have heard the law. Again, Jesus keeps bringing the law. He wants people to notice what the law says. But he's about to make it deeper and say, hey, it's actually a little bit harder than just keeping the law. You have heard the law say, or that says punishment must match the inquiry. Or the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If somebody slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat to. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, go ahead and carry it for two miles. Give it to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow it. So a lot of people have issues with this because I think this is pretty much known. Every time that there's a skeptic and you mention that you're a Christian, and I don't know if this has ever happened to y'all, but it's definitely happened to me. I'm talking about I'm a Christian. They mock me. And again, Jesus said, those who mock you, you're going to be blessed anyway. So I don't, it don't bother me. But they'll mock you. Huh, well, if I slapped you right now, would you turn another cheek? In the, in the Old Testament times, in the time Jesus was on the earth, Slapping somebody in the face was not just a physical thing. It was not just harm. Slapping you in the face was a sign of disrespect. So if, I mean, Joe, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like if, if, if me and Joe were hanging out and we're in the New Testament age, we're in the time of Jesus. If I slapped him in the face, that wasn't just physical harm. It was disrespect to him because I slapped him in the face. So what Christ is truly trying to say here is, hey, if somebody is disrespectful to you, don't be disrespectful to them. Just say, you know what, man? Keep talking. Keep being disrespectful. It doesn't bother me. Because again, the Beatitudes, Christ said those who persecute you, endure it. Endure persecution. So that's really what this is all referencing to. If somebody is disrespectful to you, it's not like saying, man, if you're in a fist fight, don't defend yourself. That's, that's not what he's teaching. You have to defend yourself if they're coming after you. But he is saying if somebody is disrespectful to you, if somebody, maybe even in the house of God, this stuff happens. I don't like that outfit you got on. Don't retaliate. Just simply say, well, I mean, I'm sorry to hear that. And just keep on about your business. That's what he means when he says, turn the other cheek. Okay, so that that isn't just, you got pied in the face. I'm finna, I'm finna slap you back. That's that, that, that was not what he was direct referencing to. That was just a cultural thing. It was understood as a sign of disrespect. So, Today, in the year of 2024, if somebody disrespect you, do not disrespect them back. Just be polite, gracious, show the love of Jesus. And again, if you think this is too hard, you may be saying, Drake, this is too hard. I want to ask you something. How much do you love Jesus? 
because I love Jesus enough to where if he says it's wrong, I don't want to, I don't want to do what he says is wrong because here, here's what I found out about sin. A lot of people like to say that, uh, it's hard not to sin or we're all just going to always just sin because we're just sinners. My question would be, how much do you renew your mind? How much are you giving your soul strength to be, to be an overcomer? You're not just going to wake up and overcome. How much are you training through Christ? And my other question would be, ask God, God, how can I love you more? Because I promise the more you love God, the more you're going to want to keep his commandments. All right, we're almost done, guys. Almost done. There's only 48 verses and we're on verse 43. Teaching about love for your enemies. <laughs> Joe, you know what I'm about to say, don't you? I had to repent here as well. <laughs> I had to do a lot of repent. And I tell you what, guys, as you continue reading, I promise you're going to repent. Let's get into it and I'll explain further. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor. And hate, oh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And <clears throat> I want to touch on verse 44. It says, but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If somebody persecutes you, normally you're going to have anger for them, bitterness towards them. And guys, bitterness is really a sickness. If you're bitter against somebody, you truly have a sickness. It's like a poison. It's going to harm you. And I think I seen one time, I can't confirm this, that there were studies that were saying it is not good for your body to, to be bitter against somebody. There's a lot of health benefits that do not, that are not produced from that. So, this is what God told me one night. I'll never forget it. It was like 12 o'clock at night. So basically the very next morning, I was just reading. And, and as clear as day, God said, Drake, prayer is the antidote for bitterness. If you're bitter against somebody, I urge you to pray for them. There's been times where somebody's done something to me and I was upset because of just of, of a situation. They persecuted me, right? Pray for those who persecute you. And, and until I started praying for them, I could not get over it. But when I started praying for them, there was something supernatural on the inside of me that began to occur. I began to feel more love for that person. I felt sorry for that person. God even began to reveal to me words of knowledge for that person. They're only doing that because of this. So you need to really show love for them because you don't know exactly everything they're going through. So if you want to overcome bitterness, pray for your enemies. And I promise prayer is the antidote to your bitterness. So that's why he said, pray for those who persecute you. Verse 45, and that way you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. I'm, I'm, you know, I use that verse too when somebody says, why does good things happen to Christians? Well, God just says it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. Matter of fact, God would actually be evil if he only punished non-believers. Because how is that fair? Because God gave us the free will to serve him or to not serve him. So it, it wouldn't be just of God if he just said, I'm going to punish unbelievers because that's not love. That means he only loves He only loves people that follows him. So maybe you maybe you wrestle with the question, well, I, I had a guy called him Papa Chuck. He worked with my mom for years, Chuck Rice, one of the greatest men I have ever known. He would do anything. He had all these beatitudes. Like Jesus said, if somebody takes your shirt, give them your coat. That was Chuck Rice. He would do anything for anybody. And he was a great Christian, great Christian, great man of God. But he got cancer. He didn't make it. He passed away from cancer. And I used to always wonder, like, God, why? Why would he go from cancer if he's such a great man of God? I thought he was one of your children. And it wasn't until I started reading the Bible that I got my answer. And I think this verse highlights it. It's going to rain on the just and the unjust. And what God was speaking to me, even I think it was about two, three weeks ago, um, it was dealing with that same question. Not necessarily him, but just in a generalized term. Why do good things have to happen to good people? Or why do bad things have to happen to good people? And God said, well, Drake, how would you think of me if I just cursed the ungodly? If I just cursed those who were not my followers? And I was like, well, that wouldn't make you just because that means you only love those who follow you. And then that wouldn't be right either because he loves the even wretched sinner, the person that just curses his name. He loves them. And so that that's why that that's the answer to why good thing or bad things will happen to even good people. And I don't know why I went on that tangent, but I feel like somebody needed to hear that tonight. Verse 46. 
If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Oh, God, thank you, Holy Spirit. That is such a great word. Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. So, guys, if somebody's been bitter towards you, Jesus is saying, if you only love people who love you back, what's the reward in that? It is more rewarding to love those who hate you than it is to just love those who love you because you're going to have so much more peace, happiness, and joy. <clears throat> if you are kind to only your friends, how much different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. So again, Jesus wants us to separate ourselves from pagans. He wants us to be Christians, right? He wants the Christians to remain Christians. So he doesn't want he, he doesn't want his followers to be like everybody else. He wants us to be set apart like a light on a hill. We're the salt of the earth. If we can't love those who hate us, we're no different than pagans. If we can't love our enemies, we're no different than corrupt tax collectors. And in that time, those were the most corrupt people as tax collectors, right? So guys, I challenge you, be different. Be the true, un unregenerate, born-again Christian. Last verse. But you are to be perfect even as your, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, he's not literally talking about you're supposed to be literally perfect because we can't achieve that. But he is saying, if you follow these laws, you better be perfect. But he's also really what he's trying to say is, guys, be more like me. I want you to love those who hate you. I want you to be kind to people that is just more than your, or that's not just your friends. Be kind to people that's not your friends. Be like me and be that example. And so, guys, that wraps up the um, Bible study tonight. And originally, we were supposed to do Matthew chapters 5 through 7. seven. Yeah, 5, 6, and 7. And then I got to thinking, as I was reading and preparing my notes, I said, oh, my God, there is no way in heaven that we're there, about there's to. There's so much of them. There's so much detail to go into mm -hmm. for chapter five and well, eight, six and seven. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's a lot to talk about in the Bible. In Shelby, how, how long is this video right now? Okay, so we just got to an hour. Mm -hmm. Right at an hour. And we would have two more chapters to go through if we were on our original plan. Mm -hmm. So, well, the first part of three. Yes. So, guys, this is part one. And, again, please stay tuned. Next Thursday night, we're going to be detailing the Sermon on the Mount, um, the second part, chapter six. And, um, you know, so, guys, don't don't miss any episodes. I promise it's going to go so much easier if you watch them in chronological order because there's going to be details we're going to touch on in Matthew chapter 10 that you won't understand if you didn't understand chapter five. And if you don't understand it, ask questions. Message us if you don't want people to think you're you're um if you if you're scared about people's gonna think if you've asked some questions, our emails in the description, send us a private message, and I promise we will answer all questions, every single question we will answer, we will respond back, and we will open every episode with answers to questions. So that way, before we continue, let's stop and talk about it. Um, we also have a discipleship training, guys, where we uh do like little Bible studies in person. Come and join us for those. Last time we had Nathan Guest, and if you want to watch Nathan's, um, you know, um, I guess um, lecture he gave about the spirit, soul, and body, then you can go back and watch that, and um, it is going to be linked, and you can only find it on our website in the discipleship section, but that's going to be linked in the description above if you're on Facebook, below if you're on YouTube. Guys, if you have any prayer requests, please reach out. Um, if you're a woman and you have a specific prayer request, Reach out to Daphne Henley or Chelsea Guest. They'll add you to their Empowering Women prayer book. And guys, ultimately, what I want to challenge you, don't think you're a righteous person or that you're saved because of things you do outward. Oh, I don't drink. I don't cuss. I don't smoke. Guys, God doesn't care about that. He cares about your heart, your attitude, and your motives. Now, are you not drinking, cussing, and smoking because they're, because you're filled with the Holy Spirit and the love of God for other people that you don't do those things? That's the right answer. So don't just think you're saved because you don't do these things. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be proud of that, but you should be proud of God in heaven. You should want to say, man, I'm saved because of the power of Jesus. Because now you put the focus off, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't. And then you give all the praise, honor, and glory to where it truthfully deserves in Christ Jesus. Um, but Joe, before we close, do you mind praying us out? Can yes, sir. But also, I like say, hey, for those who are wanting to follow along, the NLT New Living Translation. It does read different than the King James version. So if you're reading the King James, like I say, like you said earlier, there's some words in there that don't match up. You know, I ain't. I am not telling you to follow us in that. But if you want to follow us along with exactly what we're reading, yes. 
please do that. And if you have a question about a Bible verse, like I said, ask. You don't have to ask us. Ask somebody else. You know, don't just take everything we we read and take it a hundred percent hard. Read it for yourself. That's right. That's Look in the Bible right. for yourself and ask God to open it up to you. Because man, the Bible itself, yes, I'm hoping to hold my iPad up because I've got several different Bible apps on here. Don't just read it. No, don't just take it and just read one. Read a lot of different ones. Ask God to open it up to you. Have God to sh- ask God to show you what you should be reading. Ask God to show you what you, He should, what He wants you to understand and learn. Because, like I've said the last time, this is the, the the Bible is the living Word of God. Everybody can read and get something different out of it. It is there for when you are struggling and you don't you don't know what to pray, say. You don't know what to pray. You don't know what you need. Open the Bible and just start reading. God will reveal what He need, what you need out of His book. So anyway, um, Heavenly Father, God, we come to you in prayer, Lord. Ask you, Lord, to bless the people who's going to listen to this podcast and watch it, God. Father, we ask you, Lord, to touch their needs. Father, God, we ask you, Lord, to help them become hungry, God, for your will and yes. to do your work, God. Father God, to touch us, Father, give us strength of God this podcast, God, to keep doing it, to God for it to grow, God. Yes. God, we don't want to get to a place where we're complacent, God, and we for us not to be able to do your do your work and do your will, God. God, we ask for you to God each day, God, give us all a fresh anointing and a fresh word, God, from your word, from your lips, God, to our ears. Father God, we just want to thank you once again, Lord God, for letting us to be able to come here and have a chance to minister to other people. Father God, we ask you, Lord oh God, as we get, get ready to go home tonight, God, that you touch and you bless. Father God, you make sure whoever, well, I know you will, God, but whoever needs to hear this word, God, we ask you, Lord, right now, Father God, to open their eyes up to let them find it, God. And Father God, in your holy name, we do pray. Amen. Amen. See you guys next week.